um, today's Wednesday, January the 31st. I just hit the record button, realizing I kind of delayed on me there. Welcome again to the class. Uh, today's the last day of the month. We're entering week number four, and I'm going to be going over some of the particulars for this module and some of the other exciting news I have to share. All right, so here we go, and we're going to switch my screen over now. OK, so I think the screen is being shared. The record buttons buttons on. So um, for some reason, I didn't have the third class uploaded, so I'm going to have to see why that isn't the case, but I do have the two here. Uh, right now you can access. Uh, I know I gave you a link previously just for those of you who wanted to have some kind of a, a reference for the you know classes that were taught in the first segment or the first week. So I did create a virtual um, like a link for the previous YouTube channel that I had because uh, doing this online is, you know, has its challenges when you don't see the the students in person and stuff. So the best way to reflect back on some of the materials by having the recordings. And this is what I what I've been doing for the past few years now, even after the pandemic to kind of segue everything this way. So I do have a YouTube channel for the current class. So all the videos that we do, it just takes me time to like, uh, I don't really edit them, but I have to still compress them, save them, download them, upload them, do all that YouTube stuff. And finally, we have the, the YouTube channel launched here. So you do have class one and two. They're in order in terms of the more recent to the previous ones. So there should be a third one. I don't know why it's not showing up. I'm going to have to look into it. But this is... Um, this is how we're gonna have all these things uploaded and i do see some views as well i do encourage you to do the like thing and subscribe so you can get some other information when i do post new videos and i'm also going to give you access to my other videos as well so i do want this thing to become like you know an educational channel for my students and obviously you guys are part of the family now and i would like to to have this extension even going forward in the future it's nice to have a community a base system. OK, so that's what the goal is here. This way, you know, we're doing it anyways. We're recording it. Why not have it accessible? OK, so that's that. Um, I will uh, load the third one and today is the fourth video as well. So you do have you will have all the sequences there in order. I'm just wondering if it's if it's um, if it's uploaded properly or not. All right, so let's go back to our module now. So we are into um, and I do promise I'm going to have those marks for that. Uh, the assignment that you guys did for the first one there uh, this week. So you should have some kind of grade in there. If you submitted it, you have nothing to worry about. These assignments usually are, you know, like a gimme, as they say. So it's pretty good. Today we're going to venture into layer masks, layer, layer blends and layer styles, a very, very uh, important lesson for what's going to be coming up in the projects and assignments and things you have to learn. Uh, this is some of the exercises uh, lesson four. I don't know it says makeup class. I think we we'll have to skip that one there. Let me just quickly see what this is. So you know what? Please don't worry about this file here. We're going to use our resource file that we have. I just had to do that for my previous semester because it copied my course over. As a matter of fact, I'm going to delete this file here. Let me just see again what it is. Right. Perfect. All right, I'm just gonna quickly just. Oh, but you know what? I think these are the actual files. Um, perhaps this is just, I think, a reference file that I have. What I want you to get is the original file. That'll, I think that'll extend till today. After today, I'm going to give you other files to work with. Um, the ones I'm referring to is at the very bottom here under the resources tab. I did ask you to do this like a few weeks ago, so you should still have this uh, folder here. So remember layers and selections. So just make sure you keep that ready for today. And you have two different zip components. One is selections, one is layers. We finished the selections uh, segment last week because this took kind of like the two weeks that we had to cover the selections part of it. Now we're entering the layers uh, 
part of the zip file. So there's a lot of layer based assignments here that we have to do or exercises, I should say. So you want to get this other one here. So please go ahead and double click or just simply download this file here, the layers.zip file. So do that right now instead of going through that um, list that I have there um, uploaded on today's module. I think you can do either or. This one's probably easier. So just do this, download the file, and you should be pretty good. OK, I'm going to do that right now myself just to show you what it pertains. Because I think if you do it the other way, it's going to take you longer. Like it's file by file. So they're all individually. So you can go download like each one. There's no like a check mark list. I wish they had that actually. So you can just download everything all together. Uh, so uh, so uh, don't even worry about this. Like I said earlier, just gonna, gonna just delete it. Right, just gonna delete this file or just leave it there for reference. I'll leave it, whatever, that's fine. All right, so just get this one here from the resources. Uh, layers and selections, and you want to download the layers zip file. OK, all right. So now that we established all that, let's get started and see what, what else is there. Um, I'm also going to go and check out the calendar for a second. So I want to see what the grade book is. All right. OK, so you guys submitted the photo restoration. That one is due today. The photo restoration that was, remember we assembled that torn up photo, so make sure you uh, remember to submit this by tonight. OK, so these are the two deadlines that you have, and this one's already kind of done. Very good. All right, and also we have the movie poster due next week, and I'm giving you, I think, until the weekend as well. So you have like a week and a half still for that one. I right, guess that's the only thing that's pending right now. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Sometimes I, you know, kind of go off talking about all these other things that are important. I try to focus on exactly what we're, what we need to talk about. I don't want to kind of carry, carry away from the, from the subject. So let me know if you have any questions. All right. Looks like everyone's good. Okay. So you can hear me. Okay. My mic's on. The recording is on. Okay. Perfect. Double checking everything here. All right, so let's go ahead and open up the um, the file that I just downloaded. It should look like this here, the layers.zip file. Um, just to kind of show you where we left off last lesson. So we finished all these other lesson files. We finished the advanced use of I think we covered even um, alpha channels last week. A very, very important advanced exercise. I'm going to upload that video as well on YouTube so you can access it. We did cover some other advanced selection methods as well. Okay. And we also reconstructed this ripped up torn photo and I made it like an in-class exercise. So you submit it after you do that. So going forward now, this concluded our selections um, uh, I guess module, if you want to call it. And now we're going to get into more of the advanced use of layers, not just layers in general, because everything that we did here entailed layers as well. But how to use layers to meet these criteria points that you're going to be facing, uh, not just the assignments, but in you know in general when you deal with these um, you know montages and collages and all these other things. Um, so that's why this other folder now will help us get there. So this has a lot of a lot of important information and great tutorials that I handpicked for us. So this ha has a handful of folders, as you can see. Uh, one good star, just a good one is called homework. It's not really homework. It's just the name of the folder. It'll just acquaint you more with using layers uh, in general in Photoshop. Uh, very simple things like resizing. Uh, let me just open it to show you here. It's got all the wildlife under one file here. And uh, this was just some students that were struggling understanding layers and just it just wasn't that clear to them. 
So we created this wonderful exercise which they can go ahead and explore how each layer works uh, in terms of naming the layer properly, looking at the visibles, uh, merged, all these different layer attributes. As you can see, there's a nice thumbnail array of layers here and you're going to use the move tool for the most part. So the move tool is what the main thing is here. Having auto select layer turned on is very important as well because this this um, these exercises date back a few years and uh, years before that this feature wasn't even uh, on by default. You had to kind of turn it on. So up until the new versions lately, this is automatically on, but it wasn't before. So you have to identify what layer you're working with. And if you can't see these layers the way I can, you can also adjust the actual panel, the panel options on the very bottom here. OK. So the panel options, what you can do there basically is uh, increase the layer thumbnail size. Mine is set to max so you can see it better. I mean, honestly, personally, I would go with this one, but just so I can show you more of what I'm doing here, you can see my layers nice and clearly. And this would be like the layer that I'm selecting and moving around. You can see here, this is the visible of the layer. This is the way the blend mode is. Today we're going to cover different blend modes that I'm going to show you how this blend mode works. Opacity is like the transparency of each layer. That's a very important feature here. This is how you can basically filter on what you're looking at in your layers palette. So you can look at things by name. You can look at things by effects and different type of um, attributes that you can uh, control your layer um, order here. Uh, a very important thing is naming the layers. So it's also important where you click or double click in this case. Like if you double click here, for example, you're going to open up the, the layer styles, which is something else we're going to talk about a little later, how to apply layer styles on objects. OK, but if you double click like over here, for example, if it's a text file, you get to highlight the text. So the best place to double click on a layer to rename it would be around here where the name is like layer 16. If I double click in this area here, as you can see, my mouse is precisely positioned in that. Uh, on that name. If I double click, I get to rename the layer. So I'll call it Rhino. OK, this other layer now I get to move that one around. Double click on the name here and call it Buffalo, right? So I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but just to acquaint you with the layers and how and you can have some fun and move them around. Use the edit free transform feature here, which is command or control T just to get a good warm up exercise on some of the important parts of the software because without layers Photoshop really wouldn't be what it is today. So that's why it's a good little exercise to get familiar. If you love animals, it's also nice to kind of put you in that nice animal type of environments. OK, so you don't have to do this. This is just like a good little practice file. If you find it helpful, uh, by all means, go ahead, go have some fun with it. You can do this on your own time. OK, but I basically explained what this is, so I'm going to close this down. I'm not going to save it. And I'm going to move on with the other files that we have to do. So there's like a preference tour folder. These are not it's set in order, by the way. Uh, just the numbers don't reflect the order. I have a specific order. I like to go through these. I'm not going to go over some of them because they're like they're repeated from previous things that we covered already, like, for example, um, like content that we're scaling like we did that with the previous exercise. So this was something that we did with uh, with the other examples. We don't have to go through this again, right? Right, uh, but these other ones I think we have to cover. So let's look at the preference tour. These are older preferences in Creative Cloud, the original ones. This is more like a PC interface. Preference is based on your preferences, so there's no right or wrong way to do this. This is some of the just the key things that you should kind of look out for just to make things a little easier to understand. So if you want to go through this quickly, you can, but it's not really necessary as preferences do change from different versions of applications. I honestly leave mine at default unless I have to really, really sometimes go and change my increments or some of the other advanced preferences that would. But a lot of times when they put me in the classroom, I got to use another computer. I'm not going to go do the preferences every time I open up a new computer, whether I'm at work, at home, at school. It's, it's just too much, right? So that's why I just kind of go with the existing preferences. 
and they're just fine because I do my a lot of my shortcuts on my keyboard that makes a difference. Uh, these are just again some more exercise files you can practice with. Okay, nothing too uh, important here. Just a preference tour. So we're gonna just skip that folder as well and get into the more important things. This is a good one here. This is like an overall review of today. So this one we'll do at the very, very end. OK, so this is the layers folder. OK, actually, we might even do that this next week because this is this will take us two weeks this whole this whole module. So this is like something that you're going to recreate from scratch. This is the steps that you're going to follow. So for this one, by the end of today's uh, today and next week's lesson, you should be able to do all these important layer tasks like starting documents, merging documents, scaling, scaling layers, I should say, um, blending layers, masking layers, adding effects on layers, doing layer clipping and saving the proper file. So these are all important things that we we'll have to cover today and next week to get this done. So it's just very simple. Again, it's one of those assignments that you have to do in class and hand it in. And then we're going to worry about this one next week. OK, so I'm going to just leave that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to label this one red just by importance. I like to do that on the Mac. That's why I like labeling my folders. As you can see, I do that for all my stuff. Just to show you, this is like one of my, you know, clients that I work with. Look at all my folders that are labeled, right? From 2022, 23, 24. And even then you see other colors in there. Certain colors mean certain things. Otherwise, it's very hard to organize, you know, your life, your work, everything that you do in one place. Colors do help me a lot. Like I know if I go to my green colors, it's all my invoices and stuff. That's just how I like to work with legends and colors. They they do amazing things. OK, so same thing here. I'm going to make this folder a priority. I'm going to label it red. The next one we're going to get into is the blend modes and the effects and the layer mask. We're going to cover these three. OK. Uh, so I'm just going to label those ones green because we're going to cover those today. All right. Uh, this is some of the other stuff that we're going to. This is already done. I'm going to label it gray. You don't have to label your stuff, by the way. I'm just doing this um, by default here. And this is some of the image size. This is just uh, additional supplementary files Okay, that you should know how they work. So like I said, as long as we execute this whole thing today and next week, we're good. All right. So today our goal is to do at least at least these three if we can. That'll be great. But having said that, let's look at the other supplement folders. Like what is a smart object or what is an image? Let's start with the image size. So I'm going to like go backwards in a way here. So image size, basically, this is just a step by step, um, you know, resampling images. Basically, that's the term they use is changing the amount of image data as you change either the pixel dimensions or the resolution of the image. OK, so when you resize something, you're basically resampling something because usually when you resize, you're resampling the pixels at the same time. When you downsample or decrease the number of pixels, information is deleted from the image. When you resample up or increase the number of pixels, what's called upsampling, new pixels are added. You specify an interpolation method to determine how pixels are added or deleted. Keep in mind that resampling can result in poor image quality. For example, when you resample an image to larger pixel dimensions, the image loses some detail and sharpness. And you can apply things like unsharp mask to resample the images can help focus on image details. But too much of this also distorts the image as well. So the good thumb, the good rule of thumb is this. You can scale an image down, but it's never a good idea to scale it up. This is why you have the nice GoPro cameras. You have the, you know, the 32 megapixels on your phone, all these high end specs because megapixels are like a thousand pixels. So if you go like 4K quality stuff, the better the image quality, the better you are at executing on all levels, print and web, because you can always produce different things uh, depending on the project. So always go for high quality images, even when you're on the Internet, make sure you you know look for the higher Internet images there as well. All right, um, you can slightly increase image sizes upwards. I've done it many times personally. I've I've stretched images and stuff, but I did it in sequence or I did it incrementally like I did it only like 
maximum 20% of the original size. I never made something double the size that it is, because if you do that, you're just you're just kind of throwing pixels there that don't exist. All right, so this is just some of the steps that we're going to uh, follow here for this particular example, okay? Um, Yeah, this telling us to open the low res. So this is low res. Look, I'll do it on the Mac so you can see it. Spacebar just initiates a preview of the image. If I click on the other image, it's a lot bigger, so smaller, bigger, right? Obviously, the one that's high res is bigger. The one that's low res is smaller. The both might look the same, like from an icon perspective, but really they're not. So if I open both of them in Photoshop, just so you can understand how resolution and image quality works because you know you're dealing with images in photoshop for the most time uh, so this is 100 percent of this image and this is 33 percent of this image so think about that if i zoomed in 100 percent of this image this is in comparison to how clear this image is at 100 percent view as opposed to looking at this one at 100 percent view sometimes I automatically look at the, the view percentage to determine the quality of the image without me having to go under here and go into image size and check in the resolution or the size. As you can see, this one's 30 pixels. Can you change something 30 to 300 pixels? This is a common question students ask me. You can, but you're just adding pixels that don't really exist. You can even see here the detail is not all that. You can definitely add pixels or increase resolution like I'm just making this you know 10 times bigger but at the end of the day it's not going to be the real thing you see that this is the original so you can't just take small images and enlarge them or make them bigger or add resolution that doesn't really exist so just keep that in mind please and always go for the high quality images you can always resize them smaller but not bigger so that's the rule of thumb there okay all right, so this is a quick little demonstration on how that works, and um, I'm just going to close it down right now. If you have any questions, please ask me, but because that was the whole show about this controlling images and stuff. Um, I'm going to show you some Google tricks if you want when you do look for Google images. Sometimes it's okay if you use Google images. You can cite them. I prefer if you use more professional resources. A lot of times in Photoshop, you get to edit your images. Now with AI, you can get images even on different avenues as well. Uh, so there's all kinds of different methods to do this. There's websites like on Splash, Pixels, and Pixabay. They got some great images as well for free. Just got to, you know, give um, a little bit of thank you to the photographer. Those guys, those people go through a lot of, um, um, you know, um, I mean, they're professionals like us, and, and they take great time and dedication uh, you know, and time to to take these images. So the least we can do is thank them or give them some kind of a recognition. So that's always uh, there in their in their suggestive um, comment there when you grab the images from those websites. So just keep that in mind, please. Uh, this is another one here, here called Smart Object. This is also important. Uh, I know it's a lengthy type of. Uh, a description here of the exercise, but just this is just showing you how to anchor different um, different things here. All right, so I'm just going to keep this nice and simple, guys. I'm not going to make this too complicated. Let's just open it up. All right, so this is like two logos. OK, one is not smart. One is smart. How can you tell besides looking at the names of the layers? The smart one has a little uh, logo thumbnail associated with it. I'm going to make my panel a little larger so you can see that. This is a large thumbnail. So you can see now this one is rasterized or raster, we'll call it. This is that one. Well, this is the smart one. I can't even tell because they look the same from a visual standpoint. But if you look here, this one is more like like an image, like a pixel based. This one's a smart object. Now you can convert normal layers into smart objects as well. I can make this also smart by going to right here. And sorry, you got to click on the right side here and and basically um, 
converting this into a smart object. So if I convert it to a smart object, it'll look exactly like this one. It'll have the same little thumbnail. What's good about smart objects is that you can resize them back and forth uh, at different intervals. You can uh, have this saved. And let me just undo, I'm gonna press Command Z because I wanna keep it so you can see the difference. So you can save this file multiple times and open it different you know, periods of time, even like a year from now. The difference is when you have a smart object, it always retains the information. So what does that really mean is this, if I select both layers, and if I press Control T, this basically resize them nice and small, right? And I do this and I press Enter. Let's say I wanna do something else with this. That's the old Apple logo. If you guys don't recall, this is the, when I first started using the Apple Macintosh computer, uh, that this was the logo that they had on my my screen. Then they went to the, the newer, more sleek, um, you know, simple, simplified versions. So you can see how these are resized right now to smaller scale, both of these layers. One is a smart object, one isn't. Let me now open this at a later date, pretend we get into our DeLorean and go, we'll go back in time or forward in time. We press Control T, we hold Shift and we make this a little bigger again, like that, right? Then we press Enter, right? I mean, you can't really see that. You can definitely see the difference now, slowly. This one's becoming a little more blurry, and this one is still remains its crisp, clear um, resolution. So if I do it one more time, like if you do this in a different level, don't forget, files get passed around different designers. So one person will pass it to another person and resize it and scale it. Again, somebody decides to make this bigger, smaller. I'm obviously exaggerating the effect, but just to prove to you the point that I'm trying to make is basically eventually over time, you're losing a lot of quality when you're resampling images back and forth using the transform method. Like if I go like this, press enter, scale it up again. Right, you get my point. So the rule of thumb is do not scale things back and forth. Try to avoid doing that. If you do, make sure you convert this into a smart object. So then you might say, well, why don't you just have smart objects for everything? What's the, what's the point of you not have a smart object? Well, the thing is when you when you have a smart object, you can't really edit the smart object. It's not like a, you can't just go with the magic wand right now, click on this green and hit delete. It won't let you because it's a smart object. You can't edit smart objects. So the trick is to basically um, edit them prior to converting them to smart objects. Right, like see this one, I can definitely, you know, edit, delete, and, and do that kind of stuff. But for this one, I can't really treat it like an image because it's not pixels. It's in a way, it's like a vector file, but not really. It's kind of have the vector information, keeping the the pixels and all the other information. It's usually pixels though, which keeps it um, undestructible, so it doesn't really lose any quality. Whereas this one here, you can see how has its pros and cons basically. Okay, so that's the main takeaway from this. Uh, with this merchandise implementation, I'm gonna do another demo with the other example, so we'll just have to skip that one. All right, so that was the main takeaway here, the smart objects, so please remember that. And we'll do some other smart objects going forward. When you place images into Photoshop, they're usually smart objects, so just remember that. If you copy and paste pixels, from one document to another, they're just pixels. So if you go to file place, right? Let me just open another file here to demonstrate. So I'm gonna open up this blend modes folder now, lesson, uh, um, uh, lesson three here, okay? We're gonna open up this one on the left. It's called multiply, right? So these are also not smart objects, right? They're just like, logo layers this is grouped into different folders you have the cd you have the hat you have the coffee cup and you have the hoodie uh, this is a very common practice when you you know develop let's say you do some web production techniques for a website or even prints and you want to overlay logos on promotional merch or merchandise so basically um, sometimes the logo is really poor quality 
So what are you going to do? Recreate the logo? Uh, sometimes you can't get the logo that's supposed to be there. And sometimes it's really uh, poor looking that you can't even take away the white background with the magic wand. If you were to do that, it just might lose a lot of the information as well. OK, so sometimes you're, you're stuck with this dilemma where you have to still make this look like it's, you know, part of the hoodie to show the client what the merchandise can look like with the marketing plan. But you're stuck with this with this uh, poor quality logo. So what you do in this case. Is you actually use the layer blend techniques, OK? So from here, what you do is from normal and you do this for white backgrounds because most logos, if you go like on the Internet and you type in like logos. Right. Logo snap. Logos, right? Most of the logos you're going to get. Oh, maybe I should be more specific with logos. Most logos come with white background. So if you have to do like a superimposition on a logo on top of an image, most of them might have this white background that you have to either extract or, you know, superimpose and all that kind of stuff, right? So that's why what you do in this case is you just use this command here called uh, multiply or darken. These are the two that work. So for white backgrounds, this is your cure right here for that. So I'm going to use multiply. OK. And I believe this also has uh, the things cut out. So it's part of the hoodie. Same with this here on the hat. This is another logo that we have. We're going to use the multiply um, blend mode. So when you blend multiply, it just gets rid of the white background. It doesn't matter if the hoodie is white or red or blue or any other color. It just gets rid of that and it makes it look a little more presentable. So it's a fast execution process that gets the job done, basically. Same thing here. Multiply. Now watch this one. I'm going to hold shift and select both of these together at the same time. And instead of multiply, I might use like like darken because it might give me a more because multiply gives me that. That's uh, other. I think it's the same thing. They both look kind of bad. I'll stick with darken for now. All right. So the result is quick, fast. We're not here for quality in this case, just like a quick little show and tell. Because once the client likes, even like you go to Vista print and stuff, they do have a lot of this, these uh, rendering engines that produce um, your logo on what it would look like if you were to put on a product. And I've done this so many times in my past for other companies because we do a lot of mar marketing and merchandising. We basically have to put logos on almost everything from pens to mugs, T-shirts, hats, you name it, even embroidery, right? We do a lot of that stuff. So it's still a, it's still a hot topic out there. I mean, th this is a very, very active thing. And guess who has to do this? You, like the graphic designer's job is to uh, superimpose this or create a, a package that looks like this. So this works really well, the darken blend mode, and this is how you can execute this, this file. Now back to the smart object. If I was to place something here, like place embedded, by the way, it's called place embedded. Place embedded is how you place images on top of other files in Photoshop. Linked is when you associate the file that's connected with a link attribute, which means you have to, you can edit the file externally and it'll still um, update it based on the placement inside the document. So I'm going to go over this a little later in detail if it doesn't make sense. But just so you know, like a few years ago, there wasn't a two way option, there was only one, and it was just place. And place meant place embedded. So it was like a given. So let's say I place this logo, right? I press enter. And now you can see here by default, it's a smart object. OK, so that's how um, by default Photoshop reacts when you place embedded files into the program. It automatically converts them to smart objects, which means if you want to edit this right now, like do the same thing with if you want to delete something or clear something, you have to rasterize the layer. There it is. Rasterize the layer and then you take away the smart object um, part of the layer and now you can edit this. Now we can go ahead and use the magic wand 
select this red here, for example, maybe pick another color, perhaps maybe I'll go with the green, and I'll just do option delete, I'll just fill it, okay? So that's a quick way you can edit these things. You have to sometimes convert the smart objects to raster files to get this done. But be careful when you do this because there's other ways of adding color, not just, not just on a logo, I wouldn't really do this. I might do like a like a layer color overlay instead. So there's different ways, but this is this also works, right? If you want to do that, it's fine. OK, so let's put this one away now. OK, let's save it. Because what I'm getting at is the three most popular blend modes that are you know widely used in Photoshop for years now, right? And this is like a little handout explaining to you what these blend modes uh, represent. So the three that I was I'm going to cover here and the other ones are good too. They're just more creative. We'll cover that with the hard light feature, but we just did multiply. We did multiply and hard light. Hard light was very similar to multiply, which gets rid of the lighter colors. So the blend mode, just to give you a proper explanation here, I'm going to read this little blurb here. So the blending mode specified in the options bar controls how pixels in the images are affected by painting or editing tool. It's helpful to think in terms of the following colors when visualizing a blend mode effect. The base color is the original color in the image. The blend color is the color being applied with the painting or editing tool, which was what we just did. The result color is the color resulting from the blend. So for example, the white on top of the white hoodie resulted in a transparent result. That's why we knocked off the white background. Hence the multiply effect, and this is how we just did with the with the procedure here. Next one is quite the opposite. It's called screen. So screen does the opposite of multiply or or darken. OK, what screen does, it gets rid of the black background as opposed to the white background. So this will just give us this example here. If I double click or you can do this with me, you can see how this looks like a some kind of a solar lens effect and, and this even a tutorial on how to do this um, i think i have a tutorial here how to make the stars okay but you don't have to worry but this is just a supplementary i have a lot of extras and stuff for you here so if you really really have some time on your hands to explore through all this you can but i just want to get to the point and teach you what's important and then you can go ahead and because otherwise i can drag this class like double time you know if i really want to but i want to keep up with my schedule here right so um so don't worry about that just let's focus on this one here so to make this lens flare okay this this whatever this um, thing is here just going to delete it and then there's the stars which what what the stars is is an actual um it's an actual layer adjustment um using levels okay so that's how the stars were made we're going to cover some layer adjustment layers in the future when we do color correction and stuff so not to worry we'll cover those things but the way that solar flare was made if you want to just kind of have some fun with it i'll create a new layer you create a new layer by clicking here on this bottom little button. Another way to create a new layer is you go to the layer menu and you go to new layer. Uh, sorry, new layer on the top here, right? See, I, I hardly go to use the menu. I usually use this uh, menu here, the button. Once you make a new layer, I'm going to press D for default. And I'm going to press Option or Alt Delete to fill it black. Remember, white is Command Delete, Option Delete, Command Delete, Option Delete. This happens because of my black and white foreground color. It's like going here under Edit, Fill. I'm just giving you a quick review on filling, adding colors because it's important, right? Uh, foreground color, background color. Option Delete is your foreground color. Command Delete is your background color. That's how I was able to do this nice and fast. The other thing they did was they went to filter, and this is when filters become a, a more creative addition to the software. So filter render, and you have something called lens flare. Okay, so lens flare is um, is an effect from the camera producing like the flare or a reflective effect. I don't know if you're familiar with older, more traditional photography. This is what the results were. It was so popular in the 90s that they made a filter out of it to replicate that effect. So they call it lens flare, and there's different types of millimeter camera lenses. 
fifty to to um, to three hundred thirty five millimeter, hundred and five, and there's movie prime. So you can pick whichever one um, you like from these. Okay, you can move it here and stuff. I'll move it smaller, right? So this is how they made this lens there, basically. And I believe they use the uh, the the one hundred and five. I'll use this one just to switch it up a bit, right? Um, so the next thing is now, how do we produce this? Underneath this layer, there's the stars, and the stars were also made using like it's like a from scratch effect. Remember how we did stuff from scratch in the first week? This was kind of done the same way. Um, but the point is for this exercise is to understand how layer blends work. So I don't want to get too carried away with the creativity part, more like the technical part. So this is called screen. We're going to select the sun layer, which is what I'm just recreating here. And we're going to basically um, the, the, the render lens layer, what I just showed you how to do. And they use 105 millimeter prime brightness, 140%. And we're going to apply the screen effect on this one. Okay. So let me just go file revert. Just going to bring the old file back just to keep it because I want to make sure the, there's the sun a name of that layer. We're going to go over here. And obviously, the previous one was darken or multiply. Uh, in this case, we're going to go with screen. So what the screen does, it gets rid of the black background. So it like sips right through. So this creates a nice luminance type of effect where you see the sun going right through the stars in the in the universe. It's kind of cool. So if you want to get rid of like dark backgrounds, we did this like once with uh with uh we did a just an example. A student asked me they were doing like a Batman poster in an alleyway. It was dark. And how to produce rain in the alley? So we basically grabbed the picture. I'll show you this because it's kind of fun and cool. Just so because it's very simple, this little example. So I'm going to teach you more here, like dark alley. OK, let's just say we do that. Let's say we got a picture of a nice dark alley, something like this, perhaps. Right. So we, we, we save this image onto the desktop here. And then we can either create rain. It's like eight to nine steps. One day I'll we can create rain if we want. But we can also get rain PNG, like actual raindrops, maybe like black backgrounds. This is a Photoshop effect, by the way. This was done in Photoshop. This was also done in Photoshop. We can grab like these raindrops from, you know, the, you know, the Internet, whatever. And uh, perhaps um, I can just maybe use. This one was fine. I need a black background. Here we go. So if I right click and save this image as well, rain. Oh, it's a WebP file. Okay, it'll still work. Be careful when you get stuff off the internet. A lot of them are are these web files. Well, one's a JPEG, right? This is a web production file, right? So if I open this one up here. Um, it, the way to hack the WebP extension is to basically double click and convert it to a JPEG. This is a nice little hack I'm showing you because this will, doesn't always work, but 90% of the time it does work. I'll just convert the WebP format to a JPEG format. So if I open this up in Photoshop now, I should be able to have it running. Oh, it's not working this time, but it worked before. So maybe I'll just go. You know what? I'm just going to screen capture it quickly. I'm going to go look for another one. There it says screen capture. All right. Then I'll delete this image here and I'll use that example that I'm going to have. There's a screenshot. Let's open that. All right. I'm also going to dump the rain. I want to create this rain effect in this dark alley, like I'm doing some kind of an effect. I want to produce my own environment. I'm just going to drag the rain right on top. And you can see how I have the rain uh, basically covering my image and you can stretch it and resize it and do all kinds of stuff. Well, the same tactic can work here, just like we did with the sun and the stars. You can take this rain layer and change the blend mode 
to screen or lighten, right? Maybe I'll do the lighten effect and produce the same rain effect. Furthermore, you can change the opacity as well. Right? So you can really, really kind of create your own rain effect environment. OK, so it's pretty cool how um, Photoshop works with different blend modes for different results, different effects. The other example was like marketing, you know, e-commerce websites, producing stuff. That's how people make money using Photoshop. They 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 sell products with logos and stuff before they sell the product. They drop ship it from Amazon or whatever, and it looks nice and you know, people gravitate towards something that looks appealing to them and then they purchase it. So if somebody has to prepare these images, put the logos on them and do that for this is more like a creative effect. OK, where you can just implement different images together and create um, a blend effect like light or screen to produce this as well. So there's two various methods and applied in different scenarios. The third one is a more creative one as well. So I'm going to show you that one also. It's called hard light, right? Uh, so this one produces a different result based on, again, colors, images, contrast, everything that's put together, the results may vary. So if you go to the, um, what's the stars one doing here with the filter and noise? All right, so if I open up this one here, the PDF, you can see that basically the last one is a combination of the first two, but this one you can get more, you can experiment the other blend modes available. So you have the layers panel here, uh, the screen drops to black, you got the brightness, and the hard light multiplies or screens the colors depending on the blend of the color. So let's quickly open that image and see what exactly uh, the produced effect will look like. Open with. All right, so this is already masked. You can see here how we have a layer mask on the right thumbnail of the image. You can see that uh, this is something that we'll do later on as well with the other exercise files. But you see how this is masked, so it's already transparent. But even if it wasn't, you can still find a way to um, omit the background. And then behind that, you have this other background image as well. Notice how the blend mode is set to normal and the opacity is at 100%. So if you experiment this with like different, like darken, multiply, linear, color burn, all these other blend methods, you can see different results, okay? So I think for this one, we're going for the hard light to get the desired effect. It's going to definitely produce the hard light. Uh, in this case, you're amalgamating more of the contrasting values together to produce like a mixed effect. So it's creative, very nice. You get all in one basically, so you have, you're not losing any one or the other type of um, uh, visible clarity on the image. So everything kind of sips right through, like the writing and and the facial features and everything else. So that was called the hard light effect. And again, you might like other ones if it works, depending on the color, depending on the images, depending on the effect you're looking for. This is gets experimental as you go through it. So this is part of your criteria. I want to see this implemented on your on your um, a movie poster. OK, I want to see implement some maybe one or two different examples of a hard light effect. All right. And I, I believe on the next composite assignment, which I don't know if your teachers mentioned it already, I want to see some of these technical executions as well. So the challenges of the designer, you have to find a way to uh, use images together in your composition and to find a way to use these techniques, whether it's a layer mask like this one, a blend mode like this one, and other factors that we're going to learn. All right, so I'm going to quickly do another save here. All right, so that was the all the most three popular blend modes in Photoshop. The other ones are good too. I'm not dismissing them, but if I'm gonna, you know, invest time teaching you this stuff, I'm gonna cover the what's important. I'm not gonna cover every little nook and cranny because you know we, we only have 14 weeks to do this, right? So those are the main three, and the other ones again experimental. You can try them out and have some fun with them. All right, now the other folder is called effects. OK, now for that one, uh, we're going to open it up. We're going to learn how layer effects work. Now that you know how to apply layer blends, 
let's look at some of the layer effects. I'm going to pause for a second and see if you have any questions so far. I do, you know, go in a rhythm here. So if I'm going too fast, let me know if you have any questions or you want to, you know, uh, ask me something to repeat. I don't mind. Although this is being recorded, I know it does help. I like to make sure everyone is um, kind of um, in line with everything. Uh, go ahead, Serbi. Do you have a question? I saw a hand being raised. Maybe that was just a. Uh, it was by mistake. Oh, no problem. OK. Yeah. All right. OK, everyone else is good. All right, so let's keep going. Even has like a transcript on the side here, so it's pretty accurate, this stuff. Um, all right. I wanted to check something real quickly. I'm multitasking here. One. Just want to make sure the recording is like because I did upload it. I don't know why it's not showing up here. Uh, January uh, the twenty fourth. So this one here, I have to. Uh, I think I have to still get. Hopefully, I got the right ones mixed up here. Alrighty, let's go ahead and download this. This is this is last week's recording, so they delete after a while. So I'm gonna make sure all my recordings are set up for you guys. So it's all order. Seven hundred megabytes. Wow, that's huge. All right. So wait till that's done. I'll upload it for you guys. So we have all the lessons uploaded. Okay. So let's keep going. Okay. We'll go right through, and then we'll whatever time we have left after, I'll give you time to work on your on your projects and assignments. All right. So we're just gonna go right through here. If you have to do anything in the meantime, whatever, I mean, you don't have to. The good thing about this online thing, I trust you're all there, but in theory, you can kind of, you know, go and come back if you have to do something important. And if, if you miss something, you can always watch the video or you can just come back and ask me a question. That's all good. All right, so this is the layer effects part of the uh, assembly here. There's two main files to work with. This one is more geared towards this file. It's called Glows PSD. And then we're going to get into um, the bevel and emboss, which I like to kind of customize myself with you together so you can really reap the benefits of applying this very, very popular effect. And it's really good for like uh, the posters, the book covers, that kind of stuff, the bevel and emboss. All right, so basically uh, Photoshop provides a variety of effects such as shadows, glows and bevels that change the appearance of a layer's content. Layer effects are linked to the layer the layer contents when you move or edit the contents of the layer the same effect are applied of in the modified contents for example if you apply a drop shadow on a text layer and then add a new text the shadow is added automatically to the new text all right well this is too like redundant but basically an effect follows the layer you can also copy and paste effects to other layers okay a layer style is one or more effects applied to a layer or a layer group. That's also a good point. You can group layers and do an effect on all of them simultaneously. You can apply one of the, the preset styles provided with the Photoshop or create a custom style using the layer style dialog box. Another way to access these layers is through the effects logo on the bottom corner of the layers panel. My way, I like to just double click. It's a lot faster, easier to execute. And uh, basically, you can expand the style in the layers panel to view or edit the effects that compose the style. All right, so there's the glows, the drop shadows, and these are, again, the most three popular ones. Now, I like other ones too, like the, the stroke layer. Uh, there's the color overlay. There's a lot of good ones here, not just these three, but these three are the ones that are being kind of noted as important and they go through the steps of this particular exercise. So it's telling you step by step, open it and do all these. I'm not going to follow exact these values. You can if you want, but it, it'll still get the message across properly. OK, so let's open up this. This is a movie poster, something that you're doing 
for your first project that's due in a week and a half from today. I believe it's February the 11th or something like that. I gave you till the end of the week. So if you open up this file here, you'll get a picture of a very popular movie called Rise of the Planet of the Apes. And I don't think this was the official poster for the movie, but I think they created like a, it was like an exercise we did to put it together, just like a low res quality example, okay? So here we have the title. Now, a lot of these titles, this is not a real text file. Like I can't edit the font and stuff. This is literally an image. Uh, but the whole purpose of this exercise is to get you familiar with the, with the, with the, uh, with the layer styles or the effects, okay, which is the same thing. So to uh, to control this um, layer style here, you have to make sure the layer is selected first of all. There's another one called shadow, and this is just basically creates a nice shadow effect on the planet. Then there's the planet itself, right? Then there's this background. You have different like kind of cloud backgrounds which were done from scratch this is very easy to make you just go filter render clouds and then you have some credits on the bottom which makes it more of an authentic poster look okay and of course you have the stars in the background as well and then you have uh, some other supplement layers that are not important okay so now that we're familiar with the structure of the file let's go ahead and execute how this works so this is tells you drop shadow text. So basically, if you double click here, or if you click on the little effects icon that was mentioned in the handout, you can basically select a preset of the effect that you're looking for. So if you're looking for like a drop shadow effect, you can find it right here on the bottom of the list. OK, so if you click on that, not only is going to execute the drop shadow, it'll also open up the layer styles with it being checked on or selected by default. What you do then, once you acknowledge that this is highlighted, you go ahead and you increase the distance, the spread, or the size, okay? Now, I think I'm selecting the wrong layer, guys, so my apologies, I'm gonna cancel. I should select the right layer. I think I was clicking too many places at the same time. So I'm gonna click on this layer, and then I'm gonna go back over here and execute the drop shadow effect. Now I can clearly see it selected. You can also see how this is elevated quite clearly, and you can see how it's doing a nice little like popping uh, effect. So then you can control the distance, you can control the spread, you can also control the size. Okay, this is how the drop shadows are very effective. You don't want to overdo these uh, sliders because then it really takes away from the original effect here, but nonetheless, it does definitely boost its appearance. Okay, in that sense. You can also control the opacity and all kinds of other important attributes. Every effect or every style has attributes. So this one happens to be for the drop shadow. I'm going to introduce some other ones along the way. Like we're going to do like a glow for the planet. We'll make it like glow and stuff. So it looks like it's really planetary and it's got that cosmic look effect. So for this one, I'll just hit OK. And that's that. Notice how the layer that's affiliated with uh, with the effect is located here. So if you hide the effect, you can see the difference before and after, or just keep it on and off for whatever reason you choose. To hide the effect, you simply click on the little arrow here, and this just collapses the layer, so you have more real estate in your layers panel to go forward. I like to keep this nice and available, as you can see. Every time I help students in person, I always see them do this. Like it's always a struggle with the layers, you know, like they have to do, you know, like they have to scroll here. Like, like, I mean, why, why are you punishing yourself doing this? Right? Like make this nice and big. You want this to take up the whole space here. So how do you do that? You just get rid of these palettes, not necessarily get rid of them, like drag them out of the way, but double click on them to collapse them. So this, you have a lot more space here. Just makes things so much easier. Okay. So keep that in mind. This shadow effect here that was placed, I'm just going to reduce the opacity slightly just to kind of make it look a little more neater. There you go. That's a little better. 73%. Sure. Okay. We'll go 74. Okay. Now, this is where we're going to place or plant the glow effect. So, this is the glow and the inner glow. There's two glows one is from the outside, one is from the inside. Shadows have the same effect, they have an inner shadow effect and they have an outer shadow effect. 
So basically, that's how you can classify each one. Same as glows, the shadows have a very similar type of effect. So let's double click here. Instead of going to the effects menu and choosing the, you know, outer glow or inner glow, I'm just going to do it differently this time. I'm just going to double click and do this right from scratch. It's the same thing, really. Uh, the opportunity that's being presented now is for you to select each one manually. So I would bet definitely go here and select the inner glow effect first. Now, I'm not just going to check it on because if you just if you just check it on, you won't see the parameters on the right. So make sure you actually click on this tab to have these um, you know, settings show up basically. From there, you can choose choose the color of the effect. Okay, I'm gonna go with the nice maybe bright green or something like that that reflects the atmosphere. I'm also gonna select perhaps uh, the choke, the size. Okay, this all controls the uh, or the noise. Noise is not good; it gives you the, the speckles and stuff. Uh, controls the opacity maybe as well. Okay. And then maybe we'll do uh, we'll do the actual uh, the choke the size yeah we'll make the size a little bigger right we'll do that okay very good and then we're going to also add an outer glow okay so from inner glow we're going to change our attention to outer glow which is down here so notice how I'm going to click on the outer glow tab. Rather than just check it on, I'm going to click right on it, and I'm going to go over to the to the color, okay? And I'm going to pick a nice yellowish tinge, or maybe I'll go with the green, or maybe I'll just go nice and pink. Just throw it off a little bit, right? Why not? There we go, like a light pink. All right, and then I'm going to increase the the spread and the size. Now this really elevates the glow effect as well, so this really creates a nice presence. And then you can also diminish the opacity. Now, sometimes this doesn't really work too well unless it's um, controlled here. Like if you have multiply on, you might not be able to see it. So pay attention to this because by default, it might be set to multiply. So I'm going to go to normal, okay, and just leave it like that. And maybe that color is a little too, uh, there we go, maybe like a little darker, right? All right, so I'm having some fun with this. We have now this one has two effects. The rule of thumb is do not surpass like three, right? Because if you do like more than three, you're getting like a lot of effects that conflict with one another and you're losing the effect itself. So make sure you don't, you know, surpass that amount. Same as like using uh, different fonts on a, on a layout. You don't want to use more than three different fonts. Sometimes the rule is like mostly like two, but two to three is okay as long as you don't, you know, put like five different fonts on a, on a layout. It might just look a little little too scattered right uh, disorderly so make sure you follow these basic rules could keep it consistent and keep these things nice and clean all right so this was the, how we uh, were able to execute uh, these effects on um, on these um, on these images here and you can see how it's just as easy to double click and add this wonderful layer style or layer effect on the poster okay so i'm looking for you to do this as well on your movie poster projects so please feel free to watch this video again and up at least for the title or something if you see it you know uh, the opportunity to implement it i like to see that all right so i'm gonna close this down as well if you have any questions please just don't be afraid to chime in i don't mind being uh, interrupted because it's it's the way we're I can't see you, so it's like raising your hand. Sometimes it's hard for me to see. So go ahead and uh, ask any questions if you have. But this basically covered all that stuff here. Glows, drop shadows, right? Now the next one's interesting because I want to do it from scratch. It's using the bevel and emboss effect. Uh, this is the example here given to you. So if I just double click on this file here, you will see this nice texture that's being presented. Right, and you have this lettering here on top called steel on top of this background. But me just doing this and double clicking here again, like I did previously, and going to bevel and emboss, like I'm going to do right now, and just controlling the depth, right, controlling the size, 
and controlling, uh, you know, different other variables that are here or settings. And I control outer bevel, inner bevel, emboss. You can do pillow emboss, right? Like this is all nice and everything. But how would you do this from scratch? Like, how would you actually produce this texture? How would you produce this text on top of the texture? So this is something I want to show you because this is even like rasterized. So rather than just kind of wowing you with this example here, I'd like to, you to participate with me by making one from scratch. And now with the new AI capabilities of Photoshop, we can literally make our own texture and make our own stuff as well. We can still use our creative talents to do this. So let's go ahead and uh, close this file down. I'm going to close it down here. Don't save it. I'm going to ask you to create a new file with me right now. We're going to go to print. OK, because we're going to maybe print this on a nice business card, like a raised effect or some kind of a bevel. Or maybe, maybe do like a letterhead with it or we can do something else. So let's go to a letter. I'm going to go with. Um, horizontal format like landscape. All right, so it's going to be nice and fitted on my screen. I'm going to keep the resolution at 300 dots per inch. I'll keep the RGB color mode. It's going to be for the screen. And this is going to be um, a good size document to start with. I'm going to hit the create button and here we go. Make this a little bigger. Basically grab the corners out. So I keep my interface nice and simple so I can basically explain things well. So first we need to add a texture. Now textures are, you know, you can do a lot of cool things in Photoshop with textures, even before AI was introduced from filter, let's say, we can do what's called, um, you know, render clouds. I mean, you can start with clouds and you can then make any texture from here. We can make water, metal, steel, all kinds of stuff. But now with the new AI integration in Photoshop, you can actually ask for a texture and Photoshop will give it to you. OK, so one way to do that, and I don't know if you have this visible or not, I'm going to press undo here under window. I have the contextual taskbar hidden. It was a little annoying at first because it's always there in my face, so it's just right here, right? In in the, my contextual taskbar. It's not bad to have. It's just sometimes it was just getting in the way of me explaining things. Now that we're into the fourth week, I don't mind explaining to you how this works. It's an added shortcut floating little bar that follows you around that performs different operations with you. So just it's like a little helper. OK, it's like a little sidekick if you want to call it. Well, if I make a selection here, then it gives me a generative fill selection. See if I click on, let's say the type tool and I type like, uh, you know, hello there. It gives me my choice of options of fonts, right? It gives me the size and everything else. But notice how it's not changing it because you have to obviously highlight it. And then you can increase all these different numbers, right? So it's a good way to kind of aid you into or assist you with different practices in the software. I find it pretty helpful. I just, I'm just used to doing this from my menus and stuff and it's so much easier, but it is nice. It's, it's a good thing that they did bring this up, okay? So I'm just going to delete this um, text um layer there and go ahead and proceed with this next demonstration i'd like to introduce um like ai just got introduced last year really it's still fairly new but it's expanding quite rapidly and not just with like chat gpt and all these other um, tools and methods that are out there also in a visual spectrum as well photoshop also inherited some of these ai generative um techniques and you can use them in Photoshop as well. I remember the first app I got, I think it was like Wonder, there's Leonardo, there's Dali, and they produce basically all these AI generated images. And a lot of them, they're not too impressive. Some of the stuff does look good, but it all comes down to the prompts and the different way you can generate images. So it's all about the user and how you go and use the proper methods to get things done. So, you know, basically whatever you input is what you're getting out. So let's go ahead and make a selection here with the selection tool. As a matter of fact, I'm going to select everything. I'm going to press Command A, which is Control A. If you're using a, a PC, for the Mac users out there, you press Command A. And then we're going to go ahead and click on this gener Generative Fill option on the bottom. And this will give me like an actual input 
variable bar that I can type a prompt for me to get a nice texture. So we'll go ahead and put, I'm looking for a metallic gold texture. Metallic solid gold. Shiny texture. OK, the more information you give it, the better the results. So now I put metallic, solid, gold, shiny texture. I mean, I could have just put metallic texture, but whatever. I'm just trying to get some other results if I can. I'm going to go ahead and hit the generate button here on the right. What happens is when you do that, Photoshop will take a few seconds. And lo and behold, I mean, this is amazing stuff. If we had this like years ago, it'd be pretty cool because for us to get a gold texture, right? This is not bad, right? I can produce some other ones as well. Um, these are the, this is some more example. So you got to scroll to look for this. Let me make this smaller so you can see. There we go. So these are your properties for your prompt. So now you can pick the second variation. They gave me one, two, three different variations. I really like the third one because with what I'm going to do, it might work better, although this one also looks kind of cool. So we'll see what works, okay? So we'll try different things. And if we're not happy with this, we can regenerate more examples. It's going to give me three more thumbnails of examples. How cool is this? You don't have to, you already invested the money in the software. You don't have to purchase these, you know, image generating AI tools because you can just use Photoshop from now on. And then you have this one here and this one here. So I really like this first one. I'm going to go with this one. Final answer. So I was able to produce a metallic solid gold shiny texture all in Photoshop, all from scratch. Because believe me, when you go here online here and you try to do it, like, you know, we use Google for this. We're not going to, you know, like solid gold shiny texture. Right? Like, not bad. I mean, we, we still got away with this, you know. Then you go ahead and look for your textures here, right? And I would pick something like this maybe, perhaps. But this gave you, like, the watermark sometimes. Sometimes the quality wasn't that good. And sometimes you just, you know, you're not getting what you want. So either you can use, you know, images and, again, whatever works for you. Like you just These are just tools that you're learning and... The way you apply them is totally up to you. There's something similar to what I have. But let's say I want to use this. I can just copy this or save it and paste it here. See, the quality is not up to par. Even if I was to scale it up, you know what happens, right? You lose a lot of the quality as well. Now you have a little more pixelization going on, whereas the AI, it's a lot more clear. I mean, that gets pixelated as well over time, of course. But it's a nice uh, mix of the two. Perhaps I can even mix the two together. I can overlap that on that one. And I can try a different uh, blend mode effect, perhaps, right? I can do this uh, hard light effect, right? And I can perhaps reduce the opacity to like half the amount. So I, I now created my own shiny gold texture from implementing an image from the internet and implementing an AI generated prompt from Photoshop. So I kind of mixed the best of both worlds together. And you can see how pretty cool you can do things with the, with Photoshop now with this AI stuff. So I thought it's time I introduce you that in case you're wondering, hey, does Photoshop have AI? So what is Illustrator? You can go to Illustrator and generate a logo, but don't expect like the nice quality stuff. It's really, it's really wonky and very, um, you know, kind of, scattered with the with the anchor points and then the paths and stuff uh it still has a long way to get there even this is still you know miles away from being perfect of course but nonetheless it's pretty impressive and pretty cool all right so let's go ahead and continue with this uh, process here we have the texture generated i like to flatten this together so i like to like maybe delete this layer here the background select these two layers and just go to layer flatten image so I want to just keep things simple. I'm done editing. I'm happy with the results. 
I want to flatten all this to one background. And believe me, there's no nobody else in the world that has this background right now because I not only generated from AI randomly, I also put an image amalgamated using a a very um, uh, a very um, effective layer blend mode on top of it to get the really really shiny gold that I'm looking for. So now it's time to execute the bevel and emboss because when you get gold, you know, engraved or chiseled into the gold, it looks really nice. So I'm going to go ahead and use the type tool. Everybody use the type tool. But the type tool works really simple in Photoshop. You can either go just like your InDesign class, you can click and drag the mouse to draw a text box, right? And if you have a text box in Photoshop, it behaves like a text box, right? To select the text box, you can go to the corner here and resize its boundaries and the text flows with the text box. So that's good because you can use the text box for like the bottom of your movie poster or maybe you're doing like an ad, you want to put some text in there. It's good for like paragraphs and a lot of a lot of meat of the text that goes there. However, if you do like a title, like a one word, right? Or a simple phrase or something, is it's much better if you just click once sort of dragging a text box. Okay, so then I'll call this uh, poster title. Okay, because if you do it that way, what happens now is becomes a text field, right? So if you do Command T or move it around, you can just resize it as is. So it's a lot better to kind of keep it as an item than to keep it as a text box. Now we're here to do an effect that I demonstrated earlier on the way we're going to make this look like three dimensional, like the, the gold texture is literally popping out or chiseled in. So for that, there's a different approach of using the typography tool in Photoshop. I know you guys are doing typography with Roberto and you're using um, maybe InDesign or Illustrator, probably Illustrator by now. But this one here, you can use the the type mask tool. So it's called the horizontal type mask tool. It has the little dotted uh, marching ants on the edges. And if you go ahead and, and click, you can predetermine the size. I'll go with like with a, you know, I don't know, maybe um, 90, right? I'm going to pick a nice bold typeface. You know what's the boldest typeface out there that you can use that's really impactive? And really popular in the you know the marketing or signs even a lot of the large format printing impact so if you pick impact gives you a really really bold typeface okay i mean it's not new now it's been used for decades but it's still impactful and the name of the font is called impact regular 90 points so i predetermine my my font my style well, it's only comes in one style, it's regular, right? 90 points. I'm going to go ahead and click here, click once. And lo and behold, I'm getting this pink background. If you remember last week, we did layer masking. That's exactly what's happening here. It's, it's converting this into a layer mask. Now I can change the orientation to like left, center, or right align. I'll keep it left so it fits my screen better. And I'm going to type, you know, solid, gold okay i'm going to do that as you type solid gold you can see the typeface now if you move this arrow down you can move the actual um you can move the actual um positioning right uh, so once you position it here and you highlight it here you can also use command shift greater than i like these shortcuts so you can definitely increase this to i don't know maybe 135 or so Right, that's nice. Then I'm going to go ahead and move it over here. Click away to see what it looks like. So I think we're getting there. We're getting to our solid gold effect. All right. And if you want to scale it more or less, you can still do here and type maybe 150. Go ahead. I thought I heard somebody in the background. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. My, yeah my, no problem. Sure. Repeat, uh, how you do the letters, like the effect, please. Uh, the solid gold? Yeah, please. Yes, absolutely. 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 This is what I'm, 
so I'm going to um, just basically start all over again, no problem. So you have to make sure that th you have the texture already, right? The texture is already there. So you can yes. get any texture. Yeah, you can use any texture you want. I've done this stuff with water, clouds, rocks, gold, metal, you name it. We've done this. So this time you have gold, one layer. The next one, you have to make sure you select the horizontal type mask tool. This is the recipe right here. Once you select the horizontal type mask tool, you have to predetermine a good typeface. Like for this effect to work, you got to pick a bold font, like Arial Black will work too. Helvetica Bold. Impacts, you should all have Impact. It's a standard font that comes in Mac and PC. You can just type Impact, regular, and do 150 points. And make sure it's left aligned so you can catch it easier. So when you click here near the left side of the screen, look at my mouse here, right here, right here. Oops. If I just click once, it's going to give me the mask. I just messed this up. 150. There we go. And then I can type uh, the word, you know, golden, golden. There we go, right? So you can just type and then it creates the mask effect for you. Now be careful because as soon as you click away, it executes the selection. So you got to be careful how you do this. It's very sensitive. So make sure you don't, if you click away like this, right? Or here, you, you just get to redo it really. It's not a big deal. If you click away, you just type it again, like golden, golden boy, okay? As soon as you click away, it gives you the selection. Once the selection is established, I hope you can see the selection because it's very distracting with the background. Once the selection is established, what you want to do now is copy and paste. Remember Command J or copy and paste? That'll extract the letters on a separate layer. So I'm just hiding the background to show you. Then this becomes its own separate layer and you can do whatever you want with this. You can move it up if you want. You can put it on top of a different image. You can do whatever. I'm going to keep it here because it's the effect, right? Uh, what I'm going to do now, is this okay now? Did, did I, did I, did you catch the second time? Sorry, I didn't get the name of the student that asked the question, but let's quickly go yeah. here. Sure. All right. Okay. Yeah, you got it okay now, right? Yeah. Anybody? Okay, so that's Anna. Okay, Anna, that's good. Anybody else maybe that had a, a similar, if I went too fast or, I, this is tricky, it's not easy, eh? Like the, this, this always gets students a little, uh, you know, a little behind, like, oh, you know, how'd you do that? Do it again and stuff. So it's okay if you, if you didn't do it the first time. I still mess it up when I do it sometimes because it's very sensitive. If you click away or something, you got to redo it. So just be patient and try it out and it should work. As, matter, as, uh, as long as you follow the, the right steps and stuff. And uh, so once we have Golden Boy extracted here, to elevate this or to create the bevel and emboss effect, basically, what, what, what has to be done is, um, well, you can keep this visible if you want. Remember, double click, bring up the layer styles, and then you can select what's called bevel and emboss from here. You can go to outer bevel. Right. We can increase the size. We can increase the, the the we can soften it up a bit if it's if it's too solid. OK. These are really, really powerful effects that you see on, you know, a lot of covers, uh, movies, a lot of different things, posters. Right. So this is just makes it that much more impactful. Then you can um, try different bevels. You might want to try inner bevel. You might want to try outer bevel. You want to try the emboss effect. Pillow emboss is very popular. Like it literally looks like it's chiseled in. <clears throat> um, to make it look even more realistic, you can drop the, the white and black uh, properties, which is the highlight and the shadow. This will really kind of give you the softer look if you want. I'm just going to go straight up like you know, outer bevel here and then try to reduce this a bit. Right? And 
right this the way i want a bit to maybe leave these alone in the 70s bring this down a bit maybe control the size if it's too strong right either way this is how the effect works uh, another thing you can do in addition to this is you can do what's called a gradient overlay. Now, a gradient overlay will really give you the nice reflection that you're looking for. So here I can basically, you know, uh, let's go to my, I know there's gradients here too. Oranges, there's oranges here. And I can select this particular gradient of a blend. Okay, and I can control how the gradient is one look you can control the angle see that i can control it from the top left corner going to the bottom right corner either way right you can you can take some experimentation to get it perfect but nonetheless this is how you can achieve some nice fancy you know effects with typography things like you can't do in illustrator or in design and sometimes if you're looking for that extra you know movie title poster netflix kind of approach with something to elevate like i see a lot of these new movies coming out now and the titles quite emphasized with some of these effects you know you can do a lot more than just this this is just one example of course i'm going to drop the opacity a bit here so it's not too strong and there we have it click ok right i'm going to zoom out zoom in it's just a glitch on the side i'm getting here with the effect and that's how you can do the effect of of this gradients all right and again this can go into another you know image or something else you want to do with it all right okay so let's go ahead and save this if you have any other questions let me know otherwise this is just an extended version of that example that i showed you earlier i'm going to save this as gold boss texture okay and i'll put ai here as a reminder that we did utilize the ai capabilities of the photoshop and to get this done i'll say this on the desktop and there it goes all right and how easy it is for me to bring this up to another document i'm just going to go open recent and go to the um just to quickly show you That's the glows one, right? Watch this, drag and drop. Drop it down here, right? Command T. Whoops. I think I, I forgot to um, keep the... Um, sometimes it's because the effect is there it doesn't resize with the actual um with the text what you have to do is either flatten it or you can tell it to do a uniform scale with it as well okay but nonetheless you can bring this into you know another you know image and stuff like that and drag it in no problems right all right just a simple carry over and that was just drag like this hold the mouse keep holding the mouse let it go Okay, that's how you can drag and drop between documents. I believe I showed you this like a week ago. So just, you know, how to merge documents, move information from one document to another back and forth. All right, let's go on to the next one now. Unless you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. And because it's recording the video, I like to keep it nice and straight and compact. So this way we got the lesson done and then you can, whatever time we have left, you guys can use it towards your assignments and projects that you have left over all right so we covered we covered some very important topics today okay uh, starting from image sizing to smart objects we got into the blend modes which is important right we expanded some other blend mode possibilities we also ventured into the effects which effects are very powerful and and important to execute all these things right whether it's uh, the movie titles uh, drop shadows uh, bevels and effects glows all kinds of stuff now we're going to get into the layer masks and this is where when well, this is um things get a little more i guess advanced because so far we use selections and quick mask is considered 
an advanced or an intermediate form of a selection. That's good. But now when it comes to layer masks, it's showing you an ultimate control of not just selections, but painted areas of revealing images in certain areas. So this is a very important folder. Here I'll categorize it orange just to kind of elevate it a little more. These are green. And then the, the red ones for next week. And I think we're good. We're moving quite fast with this stuff. So I hope it's uh, enough. I'm doing the right pace to kind of keep you going and engaged here. And uh, for that, again, we have the video recording, so you can always go back and watch. But the layer masks is very important because from that we get to learn how to do all these other important things. So what is a mask? So a layer mask, you can use masks to hide portions of a layer and reveal portions of the layers below. Uh, white on a mask will reveal contents on the layer. Black on the mask will hide the contents of the layer. So white reveals and black hides, basically. It's like a positive and a negative effect when it comes to masking, right? So this is just giving us instructions on how to proceed with some of these files. So it's saying open this file, double click on this icon, select a brush tool. You can use like a 20 pixel size with 50 hardness, either, either one. It's going to work either way. This is just a preference. Select black as a foreground color, which we're going to do. And on the mask portion, on the helicopter layer, we're going to go ahead and um, paint around the bottom to make it mask, OK? So let's do this first one. Uh, first, OK, so let's go ahead and open this mask hide thumbnail on the left. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've, I've never gotten pulled over by helicopter before. But this sign says speed limit enforced by aircraft. So the notion is that this helicopter will hide behind the trees. So it's just like when you're driving on the highway, the cops usually hide and then you get the ticket or they pull you over and, and you're going too fast and whatever. So in this case, uh, we're going to hide this helicopter so the cars will be caught speeding, basically. So to hide this helicopter, okay, if we zoom in, how do we hide this helicopter behind the bushes? It's going to be quite the tricky ordeal here because we have a layer of a helicopter and we have a picture of a background, nothing else. It's not like the trees are on a separate layer to move them in front of the helicopter and vice versa. So masking in this case can help a lot. Another solution is to cut the trees out and copy and paste them in front of the helicopter or whatever. But masking will do just a trick, but simply just moving the helicopter in a position that might work. I can see here this, um, you know, level of trees here will do just that. I'm going to move this down and maybe perhaps we can use this masking around this area to perform what we wanted to do like that. So how do I bring the trees in front of the helicopter? So what I'm going to do here is select the layer that I want to put the mask on, go under layer, layer mask, and go to reveal all. And that's how you apply a layer mask. It's going to give you an additional thumbnail on the right. What happens when you have a layer mask now is you working with um, a black or a white uh, fill, to hide or reveal the layer. In this case, we're going to use black and we're going to use a brush. So brushes are not and not just brushes like I explained earlier for quick masking. We also use the brushes as well. This is very similar. So you would use the brush in conjunction with this layer mask thumbnail being selected and to control the size. Remember, like the handouts at 25 pixels, the hardness could be, you know, in the 80s or 90s, okay, maybe I'll go like 90 hardness, 25 pixel size, that would be pretty good. If you don't like that, you can always increase it or decrease it. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, start deleting parts of the helicopter. Oops, I deleted the wrong thing. I wasn't supposed to delete the blade, but I did on purpose, obviously. So if I press X or if I switch the white to the black, I can just bring it back, see? Because whatever you paint here on this area black, remember like we did the alpha channels last week, same thing, the black and the white. And that's how you can do all this in sequence. So let's go ahead and switch this to black again. And this time let's focus on the right parts. So I'm going to go ahead and start over here and delete this part of the helicopter. Notice as I'm doing this, the little black speckle that you see on my layer mask is, is visible. That means I'm doing all the right things to delete those parts of the helicopter. 
uh, this might be quite tedious, but it's way faster than you doing the other methods. So this works really, really well. As you can see, I'm going to go slightly purposely over my limit here. So now that I did what I had to do here, I'm going to go ahead and very carefully bring the pixels back that's supposed to be exactly with these little areas. So I'm going to press X again to bring the white on top of the black. <clears throat> and then I'm going to very carefully break the brush smaller using my square brackets. I'm going to go ahead and just basically go and trace over these areas that the uh, trees are under. I can even soften the brush a little bit and do this even more carefully. OK. Uh, maybe this part's not going to press X again. Take this one out. Press X again. Right, so X again switches foreground and background color. In this case, the black and the white. And eventually, if you do this nice and carefully, it will look like the illusion that the helicopter is hiding behind the trees. Nice and easy technique. Easy to execute. Uh, very popular, very helpful in many different creative scenarios. This is just one of them. So very simple execution and an example of how to do a simple layer mask and an effect to hide behind the trees. All right, I'm going to go ahead and save this. And the good thing about this is it's non-destructive. That means I can always, you know, move the helicopter and say, hey, I want the helicopter back. So in that case, I'm just going to click on the layer mask thumbnail. OK, watch this. I'm going to drag this dust thumbnail into the little trash can and the layer mask is gone and my layer is intact. Better than using the eraser. This is like old school techniques. Remember the eraser tool? People would literally go on the eraser and erase the helicopter. Now it's going to say, hey, you can't erase a smart object. So now it's going to tell you to rasterize it. If you click OK, it's going to rasterize it for you. So then you can go ahead and erase the helicopter. But I mean, think how amateur this is, right? Because once it's gone, it's gone. You can, you can only press Command Z. But the mask, on the other hand, gives you that flexibility and leverage to put things back and forth at any time that you wish. OK, so don't use the eraser. I know a lot of, I mean, sometimes I, I've used the eraser for more simple things, but try to use the layer mask instead. A lot more professional and, um, you know, a lot more manageable as well. All right, so I'm going to put this one away. Don't save. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll just keep on trucking along. So we just finished the first example here. Now I'm going to jump into the second example. This is another effect that you can do with layer masks, right? So I'm going to open this file up here. And I don't know why they chose Donald Trump, but whatever, a celebrity of any kind, you can use any picture you like. It's fine. Uh, what happens with this one is it already has a layer mask applied to it and the layer mask is located on the right. Uh, so what that means is if I use a brush tool and I make the brush bigger, right? Like that, I can go ahead and do this. I can delete parts of the image. And you can see how what happens when you do that. You're creating the Terminator effect. I don't know if you guys saw the movie The Terminator, but that's when you have a half man, half machine. I think we should put Elon Musk here, <laughs> right? So why is this happening? It's because this layer is covering this other layer here that has a picture of the Terminator um, skeleton facial composition. So by you putting one layer on top of another and doing that and make sure you size the layers accordingly so it matches the face, you can do what's called the Hollywood special effects. OK, so that's another way you can apply the layer mask on top of images to produce that effect. That's why you have like, you know, you can have a face that looks like a tiger or an animal or a wolf or something you can mix. You can do like a hybrid effect. All right, so I'm going to put this one away. That was just uh, another cool effect that you can do with people, OK, or celebrities. And now you have this other one here called uh, fish frog, another similar blend. But this one, I'm going to teach you a, a new technique that's very, very um, transitional and, and natural if you know how to apply it properly. So if I double click here, you can see that the image looks like this. 
the name of the file is called fish frog. So I'm just going to move the frog on top of the fish in the exact position. Sometimes you might need to resize things back and forth to fit them in the right placements. I'm going to delete this top layer because it's like the finished product. I'm just going to delete it to show you what I'm going to do. And the thing with this one is I want to blend this naturally so it looks like the fish is like a frog. Because it'll look really abrupt if I was just to, to cut it like that. It doesn't look realistic. How do you make this look realistic? Is using the same methods I've demonstrated previously by adding a layer mask. Okay. Now another way to do this, this is my favorite method, is using the little bottom palette here. So if you click on this little button that says layer mask, it's got a picture of a little puppy. So if you click on a layer mask, look a little tutorial too. A layer mask allows you to hide parts of your image and then bring them back visible at any time. They can be thought of as a smart eraser that gives you full access to anything you removed from the image. Image information will never be lost or deleted if you use a layer mask properly. Masks allow the opportunity to make powerful edits with the flexibility to change them later. Masks appear next to the layers in the layer stack. To make adjustments, be sure to click on the layer mask, then paint black on areas you want to hide and white to reveal them again. To cut something out, start by making a selection of the object, then click on the layer mask icon in the layers panel to cut it out from its background. Layer masks are also great for editing specific parts of an image, like adjusting color or exposure. All right, nice little video. I like that. This is Adobe, so these guys always do a good job demonstrating stuff. Uh, so that was more like a simple example, but a, quite a good one. I like how he explained that you can actually go make a selection of this. So if you like whole command click or just make a selection and then do a layer mask, it'll just isolate that on it automatically which is good, but we can also extract it with copy and paste like we did in the past. Just many ways you can implement layer masks like this. Uh, but for this example, I'm just kind of make this look more like a, a, an effect where it blends out. This is where you really have to involve artistry into the, the art of making layer masks more effective. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, click on the layer mask thumbnail. Notice I have no selection. I'm just going to click on this layer mask thumbnail here. And by doing that, I've added the layer mask. And now I'm going to use the, the brush, black or white. But this time, I'm going to pick a nice feathered brush. Or I can just lower the hardness to zero. Zero means very, very smooth feathered edges. And the trick for this is to make the brush huge, like 125 pixels or more. By doing this, I'm just going to simply start erasing the edges here and get rid of the sharp effect to make it look like it's nicely blended to the background. And this is how you can see here on my thumbnail on the right, you can do a nice transitional effect or blend with a layer mask on one image on top of another. Now, I like this a lot, and I think this is fine, but I got one more thing I want to show you. So I'm going to press Command Z, Command Z, just to keep this back to the way it was. And it's sort of using like a brush tactic, which again, I, I really love and I think it's great. Sometimes it might not be enough or you might need something more um, geometrical, something more linear, like a perfect 45 degree angle or a 180 or something linear. So in that case, I'm going to use the gradient. This is another little gem secret right here I'm sharing with you. So use the gradient tool, which is under the paint bucket. You have to kind of look for it. Once you pick the gradient tool, make sure you have black and white selected, which is, you know, the basics. The basics is your foreground and background color. If you have, let's say, red and, um, well, I'm in a layer mask mode. Just make sure you press D for default, D for default, and pick the black and white. It has to be black and white, because then what you do with the gradient is you swipe from right to left, or, sorry, left to right. See? And you can do what's called a linear blend, which is perfect. Then you can grab this further out, further in. You can control this because now you're fading in the black and the white. And what better way than a gradient? So you can definitely control how nicely this spreads, 
how much this extends and so on and so forth. Now you can't surpass the original, you know, end of that layer. So you have to kind of go within and then stop there and move this up back and forth. I really love how Photoshop enhanced the, the gradient annotator. It all stemmed from Illustrator doing it a few years ago. And now Photoshop finally did it in this 2020, I think four or 23 version even before. Really nice and it works really well. And you can see the results here. You can do some cool blends with layer masks as well. All right. And I love these little tutorials, eh? You can just click on any one of these things and it'll basically show you how to use these uh, little methods. Okay, perfect. So now let's go ahead and uh, save this. Okay, I'll just close it. All right. And last on the list we have, now this is again using more advanced features of the of the layer masks and how you can utilize them properly. And again, this is the handout here. You can follow these steps. Or you can just watch the video and do it with me here. Then this did cover the gradient as well. Okay, just for the record. For this one, we're going to use the um, the channel mixer layer. Okay, so this one involves a little bit of layer adjustments, which is very powerful component of layer masks. So let's go ahead and open these um, sunflowers, right? We have this what's called a channel mixer. Now this is a layer adjustment layer. Because an image by itself is an image, but if you do a channel mixer, you can control how the image is being perceived through the software. And this is just a channel mixer that has, um, let me just be careful again, you got to click in the thumbnail to open up the settings for the channel mixer. And what a channel mixer does is mixes the different color values or channels in this case, and its output channel is set to gray and the preset is custom and back and forth. Okay. You can then control the red, the green, the blue, because the way the colors are interpreted is by black and white channels or, you know, filters that they use from the back end. So this is how you can do some cool stuff in Photoshop to do this from scratch. Just remember gray custom, right? Let's just say I want to do my own channel mixer. I go to the um, adjustment layers. These are adjustment layers. These are like presets, things you can do by default, or you can do the most popular ones. Like for example, let's say you want to do brightness and contrast. Now this image is already quite vivid, but if I do go to brightness and contrast, and there's the adjustment layer on top of this background, I can definitely increase the brightness or the contrast, you see? So that's what adjustment layers do. And for color correction, photographers love to come here and do this because you're not always going to take that perfect picture on a sunny day. So you might have to brighten or darken certain parts of the image or color correct the image to make it look more professional. So definitely this is, that's why Photoshop is the go-to software for, for many professionals, not just photographers, and designers and stuff. So we're going to go to, um, again, the adjustment panel here. And we're looking for the, here it is, channel mixer. That's just something that's specifically chosen to produce a black and white contrasting effect of the color image. You see this a lot on commercials, like Yellow Pages did it, famous movies did it. You, you, you convert the image to black and white and you accentuate a part of the image in color and you really bring out the attention of that particular part of the image. So by me doing a channel mixer, and controlling this to uh, custom, I think I had grayscale. Let me just go to, I think it's the black and white yellow filter. There we go. And this was gray. Okay, so that's fine. You can use this one, that one. Maybe I'll stick with this one here. They're all different filters, right? I'm going to go with this preset, okay? And then I'm going to increase the, the green channel a bit, the blue channel, and we'll bring it down a bit, see? And the contrast, I'm going to increase it as well. So you can see how I'm, I'm dousing out. These colors basically are converting the channels from grayscale to from RGB to grayscale as an output field. 
So that's the effect, basically. I produced this, I converted this image into grayscale. That's all. I could have also went to image, convert to grayscale, but it wouldn't give me this control that I have with controlling all these different parts of the channel sipping through. And you have monochrome and different types of uh, effects as well. So now this is where the layer mask comes in, because when you apply the adjustment layer, it already comes with a layer mask. So all you have to do is select the layer mask portion, use a brush technique, like I'm going to use the brush tool here, zoom right in, pick your target, make sure you have black on the foreground color, not white. Then you can go ahead and start coloring parts of the image that you want to kind of bring back. So you can really have this cool effect where everything else is grayscale, but this one image is color. And it really creates that nice attention grabber, right? I'll get a little bit of the blue, sure, why not? So if I zoom out now, you can clearly see how this is an attractive proposition. I'm going to go over here, do the same thing. I'm just coloring it in with the brush here. And the flex, look at the flexibility again. If you go too much, you can always press X and delete it. They've total, total control. Just like quick masking, right? Let's get one more. Press X. Right. So now I have this nice looking creative design. And, you know, this. I've seen stuff with people wearing outfits and clothing, and you can name it. There's so many different examples of creating this wonderful effect using a layer mask and creating a contrast. In this case, we went further and made a channel mixer of different, um, you know, RGB values, converting them to a grayscale output to create an effect like this. And of course, layer masking is along the way. So I demonstrated a lot of methods of being creative using layer masks and also from a technical standpoint and a creative standpoint. So you can do a lot of cool, interesting things. And I know I kind of put everything together. Today is like a very important lesson, as you can see, because we covered a lot of important things. So these kind of things, we're going to implement them again later with other examples. This is not just something I just throw at you and hope you hopefully you can remember. But I like to introduce these techniques because it's going forward. We're going to incorporate these techniques with other techniques along the way to get things done. But nonetheless, this is important and hope it wasn't too overwhelming because I know I, you know, in the classroom setting is different because I pause, I walk around, I we make eye contact, I see you. I'm doing this online. The challenge is I, I can't see your faces and I'm hoping I'm delivering this properly and you're understanding all this. But going by my my repertoire or my pedigree and the experience, I know my students do well and your projects and your assignments will reflect that. So I don't, I, I'm pretty quite confident that you're good with this, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'm assuming everyone's okay and you guys are fine. All right, so I'm going to close this one down here. Save it. Uh, so that those were the four files we covered today. And this is the, the, uh, the, the handout that I used to give to my students. You can print this and kind of go over it as notes. So this covers all the principles, uh, you know, written in forms, uh, point forms and stuff. Uh, the video is also recorded, so you have that also to go by. And you attending, of course, is important because you can ask questions and interact with me so I can help you learn this stuff as well. well so having said all that, I'm going to keep the video you know, not as long as necessary. So that is done for the recording. Hope you enjoy today's lesson. I'm going to see you all in the next video. I'm also going to post the previous video. So uh, that'll help us kind of understand all the stuff we're learning. All right, so keep up the great work. And I wish you all a great week ahead and have a good night. Bye for now. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.